Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I want to do a quick sound check, make sure you guys can hear me. Yep, you sound great. Great, thank you. Well, again, uh, welcome back to of the virtual NASA conference. It's good to see your faces in those tiny little boxes uh, and appreciate you joining us today. Uh, yesterday was a fantastic session. Um, I think we learned a lot. I've already reached out to some of the panelists and asked for uh, uh, them to join our conference, virtual conference here in Washington State. So just another example of how we can um, learn from each other and uh, learn from experts and then bring that information home uh, to our home states or territories. So uh, just been a fabulous day and expecting another day again. Um, Amy's getting lots of shout outs, but again, I have to say that this would not have happened. Uh, our ability to come together virtually would not have happened if it weren't for Amy and we are so very lucky to have you. So thank you, Amy. Um, our first panelist join us. <laughs> Uh, so excited, um, definitely important topic for us to be discussing, um, particularly in the environment that we're in today. Uh, so please welcome me in joining, uh, welcome, please join me in welcoming Ryan Piranunzi, the project manager from workelections.com, Wayne Benna, the deputy secretary of state uh, for the Nebraska secretary of state's office, and Chris Piper, the Commissioner for the Virginia Department of Elections. So welcome all. Oh, wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to, to uh, speak today. Uh, I'm sure that um, I think uh, many of you I've, I've uh, sent emails to you over the past uh, you know, six months as we have built this website out. Um, and I'm glad to see you. Um, uh, and, and talk more about it and let you know where we are and uh, how we hope to help uh, this year. Uh, so Work Elections is a project of the Fair Elections Center uh, that uh, originated in 2018 as a pilot project in um, eight states. And since then, we've expanded it to include jurisdictions across the country. And the idea is to uh, consolidate information uh, on poll worker requirements and links to applications uh, for every county and town in, in the states where it's done by town uh, uh, across the country. So people would have a one-stop uh, location to figure out how to get involved. And I know that um, Bob, our president and CEO, has spoken to you uh, all in the past. So some of you may be familiar with um, with this project. Uh, so. As I mentioned, it's, it centralizes poll worker requirements and application links, and it provides this information in a uh, clear and concise way so that people who have never served in the past uh, can access the information that they uh, need and um, figure out how to get involved. Uh, and we also have built in the capability uh, to allow each county to specify uh, specific needs that that, that are in high demand or, or that they really uh, need, such as um, bilingual poll workers or um, people with particular technological skills. Um, and uh, the website now includes all of the, this information, including contact information for local election offices, training requirements, uh, the hours that poll workers can expect to work and whether or not they need to work for the full day or if partial days are allowed. Uh, and of course, the, each state has their own unique um, requirements for voter registration and uh, residency. Um, and so the website currently, if you go to the homepage, workelections.com, you are prompted to select the state that you live in and then a search bar appears um, and it'll uh, instruct you um, whether to search for a county or to search for a municipality uh, based on what state you're, you're in. So this is what the home page looks like currently. Um, and we have, uh, so every county in Alabama, for example, you, you start typing in, uh, uh, if you start typing in letters there, it'll auto-populate a, a list that can then be clicked on of, of the various counties with, uh, with those letters in their name. Um, uh, just really quickly on how we built it, a lot of your uh, local election officials, uh, well, really all of them have received surveys from us 
starting back in um, February, uh, asking them to submit a survey monkey that um, when they submitted that was was auto populated onto the website and that served as a really um, great way to get information directly from the source and um, to make sure it was as accurate you know totally accurate uh, and I'll, you know just due to um, all the work and the um, responsibilities that local election officials have obviously it we all we had to do follow up um, to make sure that we got information for every jurisdiction. Uh, so now we have uh, comprehensive information on uh, over 4,500 jurisdictions around the country. <clears throat> uh, this is what a uh, jurisdiction web uh, specific web page looks like on work elections. So there, there's one for each jurisdiction uh, in the country and um, the three buttons on top link to government websites um, and the apply now button will if there's an online application uh, available it'll link directly to your application uh, so we're not we're not um, you know asking them to fill out something else and forward that along we're, we're sending them directly to uh, local um, ele election applications or to uh, in the cases where those don't exist we send them to a state online application if the state has set up something. Um, and if in the cases where there's neither of those, uh, the website work elections allows, uh, basically has the apply now button when people click on it, uh, it'll uh, allow them to send an email, like a, a form email to whatever email address we have on file for that jurisdiction uh, indicating, you know, uh, this is who I am and I'm interested in, 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 in serving, uh, please, you know, get back to me. So um, that's what we've built in for the counties that we couldn't find any online applications for. But I think at this point, uh, uh, a good chunk of them have uh, links to online apps. Um, I wanted to talk about Power the Polls. Um, this is a new initiative that uh, some of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard about in the past um, week or, or it, it launched two weeks ago, so it's new. Um, it builds on the work of the Fair Election Center and Work Elections uh, and expands on that. It's a coalition of groups, both in the nonprofit space and um, private companies, who are all focused on addressing the potential poll worker shortage for the fall. And um, we're combining resources and collaborating uh, on this issue. Uh, so the Power of the Polls Coalition includes groups like the Civic Alliance, which uh, is made up of 86 um, private sector companies that have made civic engagement a uh, top priority uh, for, for themselves. And uh, that includes big groups like uh, Amazon, Snapchat, Starbucks, as well as Time to Vote, which um, groups is a group of businesses that is you know, giving their employees the day off on election day to vote. And uh, the idea there is they're that because they have that that day off that um, some of them hopefully will uh, choose to serve their communities as poll workers and a lot of other uh, groups as you can see uh, are involved and this website uh, is it, it's powered by the data from work elections um, but it adds a bunch of uh, new functionality so that partner groups for example that want to utilize our database Will, have, will be able to um, incorporate it directly on their website through like a white labeled version of, uh, of the database. Uh, and it will also allow for much more robust follow-up uh, for people who have, you know, indicated that they're interested in serving. Uh, it'll you know, follow up via text and email um, to encourage them along the process and to help them with any issues that might come up as they're trying to get involved. Um, so obviously we are uh, striving to keep this database fully up to date. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, I've noticed re in recent uh, weeks, there seems to be a lot of, um, of great new sites coming on board, uh, both at the local level and at the state level for poll worker recruitment. And um, it would be you know, wonderful um, to have, um, to be in, in communication about any potential changes that are uh, 
that are happening, any new sites that are being launched, so that um, you know, on top of the of the due diligence that we're going to be doing, we we make sure we're presenting um, the most accurate and useful information for everyone. And so, some of the um, speaking with you know uh, groups that are looking to recruit poll workers, you know, some of the questions that have come up are. Um, uh, are part day shifts going to be allowed? I know that that, that is definitely a, a challenge for uh, administratively for a, a lot of election administrators. Um, but uh, that, that if that is something's changing with regard to that or um, around uh, voter registration requirements, um, or if there are new applications being launched, uh, those are all things we're going to be keeping an eye out for. Uh, but if you, um, you know, we'd be happy. And, and would appreciate being in touch um, about any of those as well. Um, and secondly, uh, one of the big questions that's going to come up, that has come up and is going to continue to, to be there around uh, the efforts to recruit poll workers is, is what are people getting themselves into? Like what's the, um, what is it going to be like on the ground? And um, there, I know that there have been some uh, state websites that have included information recently on uh, the steps that are going to be taken uh, in each precinct and polling location uh, to protect voters and poll workers. Um, but, you know, um, it would be great to see this uh, adopted by every state so that we can draw that link to that information for people who are thinking about getting involved and so that they know, you know, do I need to bring my own PP or what, is, what are the sanitation processes going to be like um, uh, in the polling place? How is social distancing going to be um, incorporated and, and things like that. Um, so that, uh, that that will really help, I think, with recruitment uh, efforts because uh, people naturally are hesitant to sign up for something where they don't really know what they're what they're going to be experiencing. Um, so, regarding communications, there are a lot of groups now really interested in this subject, and in an effort to lessen the amount of emails and con contact that are uh, going towards both your state offices and local offices, we're through Power of the Polls and all the groups involved in that. We're going to be coordinating on outreach and trying to streamline that so as to not um, overburden uh, or flood the, the lines uh, with election administrators across the country. Um, and, you know, if there's any questions you have or any ways in which we can be helpful to your efforts, um, uh, or if you have, um, you know, particular um, parts of your state's jurisdictions and your states that really need extra focus or whatever it might be, please uh, reach out to me. I, um, would love to speak with you about this. Um, so thank you. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, missing you all, and I uh, hope you are doing well wherever you are. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before uh, we get started. Uh, some questions that I got. Uh, John from Colorado, this is called a tie. Uh, it was used uh, prior to the COVID-19 to wear to work before sweatpants. So. Uh, second question, uh, for, ja, uh, for Jared in Kentucky, it's great that your kidnappers got you a background. Please bring uh, blink twice if they're uh, feeding you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So I um, want to talk a little bit about the Nebraska experience uh, and ask in regards to poll worker. Um, and so uh, this is uh, the end, and we'll start, we'll start at the end, and then we'll work our way back to the beginning. So. Nebraska's primary was held on May 12, 2020, on the statutorily required date. Uh, 493,000 voted, breaking the record of 413,000 who cast a ballot in 1972. Uh, 415,000 voted early by mail, and 77,000 voted at their polling site on Election Day. And all 1,225 precincts opened on time and with the amount, appropriate amount of poll workers. Um, well, our first case of COVID was diagnosed on March 1st. Uh, most of our shutdowns uh, occurred around the March 13th timeframe. I remember that because my birthday fish fry got canceled and I was very disappointed. Uh, but by March 26th, we had a press conference with the governor uh, to announce that the election would be held as scheduled uh, and we were doing everything we can uh, to make sure that voters and our poll workers uh, were protected. 
So the question that we get asked is, well, how did we do it? So we sent an early ballot application to every voter. Uh, we purchased a, a secure ballot drop box for every county that did not already have one. Uh, closed election offices for in-person early voting except for those that needed to use an ADA accessible ballot marking device uh, to help control the spread of the virus. Uh, we used radio, print, and social media to encourage early voting and the recruitment of poll workers. And we procured PPE for our county election offices and our polling sites. Each one of those things I could probably spend an hour on, uh, but uh, I can only spend 15 minutes with you, so we're going to go with uh, the one, what I'm asking, what we've been asked to talk about today, the recruitment and protection um, of, of poll workers. So the first thing that we did uh, in March that we announced on March 26th at our press conference was that we procured uh, a precinct level hygiene kit. And taking us back to March, this was something that you couldn't find. Gloves, hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, were in very short supply. And we had a vendor here in Nebraska uh, that was willing to hold what they had in stock and put together kits for us uh, so we could announce to poll workers that they would be protected. Um, and so uh, later on, beyond the Clorox wipes, the hand sanitizer, and the gloves, we were able to secure N95 masks, uh, to which they were added to uh, the kits uh, by the company uh, free of charge. Uh, later on, we uh, procured face shields, uh, and we sent those uh, directly to the counties. What this allowed us to do in March is was to stop the bleeding. Um, we had a lot of poll workers that were of a high-risk category that were dropping out, but we wanted to let uh, our election officials know that they were going to be protected, and thus their poll workers were going to be protected. And while we still had people to drop off, once we announced that, it, the drop-off started to go down a little bit. And we know these were effective because the counties kept getting calls, hey, have you gotten the kits yet? Have you gotten the kits yet? And those were going to be delivered later on uh, towards the, when it got closer to the election just because of storage reasons. But we knew it was a factor because when the poll workers felt like they were being protected, then they were more likely going to show up on election day. So this was something right off the bat in March that we could guarantee to the poll workers that we would keep them safe. We added many things on later, but this was the first thing that we did in March. So this brings us to the end of March and my favorite meme, uh, are I've almost completed my 90 day trial of 2020, how do I cancel? But we still had six weeks to go before our election. So it was how do we encourage people uh, to volunteer for the first time? And one of the things that we did uh, was try to promote a law that we already had in the books in regards to 501c3 groups uh, could recruit poll workers for election offices and then the poll workers can then designate that their pay could go to that organization in, uh, in general in one bulk check uh, versus uh, being paid individually. This was originally rolled out to Rotary Clubs, Optimus Clubs, what have you, because a lot of them didn't have the fundraising um, anymore uh, that they were used to because everything was shut down. Uh, while this was promoted initially, we didn't find a huge lot of success as we did in others because some groups weren't really concerned about uh, um, money at that point. And so because of the uncertainty of what the virus was doing, this didn't uh, result as as many people as we would have liked. So we went on to how can we recruit specific individuals. And so uh, the first thing we did, uh, and I will say is if you are not part of the weekly Friday uh, NASA election directors call, join it immediately. Uh, because uh, we get a lot of good tips uh, and are able to borrow stuff from our colleagues. And so on one of the Friday calls, uh, Amanda Grangine from Ohio talked about how they recruited uh, lawyers from their bar association to get free CLE credit towards their license uh, to be able to do that. I instantly, upon hearing that, emailed uh, the secretary. He agreed and we worked with the bar association uh, to be able to do that, to which they agreed. It was a little bit different uh, of a concept uh, in regards to they had to go to their training, uh, they had to serve as a poll worker, and then they were given a uh, code so they could access a free 1.5 hour uh, CLE that they could do online uh, that would go towards the 10 hours that that was required. It was a little more than I would have liked. I would have liked the training uh, that they got from the county election official to be the actual training, but because of the deal that we had to work out, this was the way it had to go. But 
I want to give full credit to, to um, Mandy in Ohio for this idea. Um, it, you know, we borrow the best of what we see. But once we took this idea, we took a look at, well, could we do more? Um, and so much like the Big Ten Conference and Ohio State, they chose to expand. And when you expand, you add Nebraska to make yourself better. And I can only say that because uh, Mandy didn't join the call today. So uh, you can't defend yourself. Um, so how could we expand this program? And what, next thing that we did was, well, what organizations require continuing legal or a legal education credit, and could we uh, work with them? So the next place we asked was our Nebraska Society of Certified Public Accountants. They had also an education requirement. And who best to account for ballots and account for uh, the people that show up at your polling site than accountants? Uh, they agreed, uh, and they uh, didn't have any other requirement other than they had to go to the training, and then we just had to confirm it uh, with the organization to get that 1.5 hours. The one thing I probably would have done a little bit differently with the accountants, we used the 1.5 from Ohio, which from the Bar Association, which used the Bar Association here, well, we require 10 hours, so that's like 15% of the hours. Uh, accountants require 40 hours, so 1.5 out of the 40 hours they need wasn't too much of a, uh, uh, a help um, in regards to this. So we're going to work with them to see if we can expand that to maybe 10, 15% of their hours. Hopefully in the general election we can get some more people to do that. So after we uh, work with the accountants, we put out a press release uh, with the Bar Association and, and the accountants, and they also did uh, uh, email blasts to theirs. And right after uh, we uh, put out the press release, the, uh, we were approached by the Nebraska Realtors, well, why didn't you include us? Well, actually, Realtors don't even have an education requirement here in Nebraska, but they want to be a part. They didn't want to be left out, so uh, we added them later uh, in a press release, and they recruited members on Election Day. And what I saw uh, a lot on Election Day is they did a great job of social media presence showing their members all across the state uh, serving as poll workers, and it was great advertisement uh, for them. So these are just some of the poll workers that were recruited. So even by just, even though we might not have gotten a whole lot of lawyers and even a whole lot of accountants, the publicity and the buzz that we got from earned media allowed other organizations and other folks uh, to be able to step in and uh, help us uh, at, to fill the gaps as people started to drop out. But there's only so many organizations that we can do, and so we did an outreach campaign uh, to be able to get individual people in individual counties uh, to be able to um, volunteer as poll workers. And so we developed the Step Up campaign, and I want to give uh, complete credit to Jennifer Hammond in my office that created this. Uh, this was probably one of the great things that came out of this election was uh, this uh, logo, and we'll show how uh, we use this uh, throughout. So we used a lot of new school and old school ways to reach people in all different urban and rural areas of the state. We partnered with the Nebraska Press Association to put an ad in every newspaper in the state at the same time for three consecutive weeks, uh, letting folks know that we need poll workers and where they can go to uh, uh, do this. This was done in conjunction with an early ballot application, how they could, you could early vote, um, and this generated um, not only the advertisement, but uh, reporters would write stories in the newspaper regarding the advertisement and asking people to be recruited as poll workers, asking the local election official what the needs were. We also did radio ads. Uh, the Nebraska uh, Radio Broadcasters Association partnered us with PSAs that we then supplemented with paid advertisements because we found that while PSAs were great, they were done at 2 a.m. in the morning and we weren't reaching the people that we wanted to reach. Uh, so we started to pay for some of those ads so we could get, uh, re, uh, get it at uh, more appropriate times. We also did a mailing, and this mailing was probably one of the most uh, talked about and best recruitment tool. When we did the early ballot application, I bought 400,000 pieces of paper in anticipation of using that, all that paper to send uh, the early ballot applications. By the time we actually uh, got done with that mailing, we had about 135,000 pieces of paper left. Well, instead of just, you know, filing it away, we decided what could we do, and we ran the numbers of all the counties that still wanted help with poll workers and found approximately 130,000 registered voters between the age of 18 and 50 um, would account for that um, to do a mailing. So we mailed uh, this uh, um, 
piece of paper trifolded uh, with our logo, the Step Up logo, uh, to all eligible voters 18 to 50 in the counties that needed a little help. And what we found is, is that when the counties were ready to start, uh, when they were done processing early votes and start to get new poll workers, they had a stack in their offices of this mailing uh, that they could go through with leads uh, to get people to uh, sign up as poll workers. And our, our team here works uh, feverishly to provide online training. Um, and the um, online training that I did for the Bar Association was used also for our counties to be able to train their brand new poll workers uh, in that last two weeks uh, that, didn't, that wouldn't have had any other opportunity to uh, come in. We also did uh, social media videos. I didn't know if I was going to be able to embed this, so I just did a little screenshot. Um, but I was um, able to embed it, so I want to just do this quick video of how we tried to get young people uh, to volunteer. Good afternoon. I'm Lane Bennett, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, encouraging younger Nebraskans to step up and serve as poll workers on May 12th. Members of our greatest generation and their families have served our communities year after year as poll workers. So for this election, some are choosing to sit out, and that's okay. So now it's up to my generation and younger to tell our parents and grandparents, we got this. Poll workers are paid, and you cannot be forced to take a vacation or sick day in order to serve. And if you're unemployed, it will not account against the benefits that you're currently receiving. Training can be done online, and the service you're providing to your community not go unnoticed. Contact your local election office or visit srs.nebraska.gov to look up for information. This was viewed uh, 20 times, 15 by my mother. So, uh, but just wanted to show the different ideas that we had uh, to be able to reach out um, in print, but also social media and, and, and YouTube uh, as well. So, uh, we found towards the uh, weekend of the election, I only had two counties that told me that they didn't have enough poll workers. And even in those counties, it was just a, a few that they, they needed. So um, throughout this entire month of April and March, uh, I worked on a, a secret project that we called Project DSOS. Uh, DSOS is uh, the reason why for that. Many of you know that I used to be in a local election official and uh, called an election commissioner. My nickname was Commish. I loved that nickname. But when I moved on to this job, I didn't know how to have a good nickname. So my replacement said, we'll call you DSOS, Deputy Secretary of State. I didn't like that because it seems like it's what you dip a McNugget in, DSOS. So I chose not to have that nickname. But uh, it was a great nickname for this project that I work with our National Guard uh, to get volunteers uh, to be able to, uh, volunteers, not orders, but National Guard members who volunteered to serve as poll workers uh, in different uh, communities. And I didn't tell my clerks this because I didn't want them to rely on these folks. I wanted them to volunteer, get people, the volunteers on their own. But I set uh, 100, these 130 uh, folks in eight different communities as backups. So they were strategically placed not only in hot zones, at that point our meatpacking plants uh, were becoming uh, hotbeds for COVID, so I wanted to make sure in those places we had uh, backups, but also they were strategic that they could be sent anywhere within an hour uh, to a different county that needed to have uh, poll workers. Uh, we didn't end up needing to have them, and so they stayed in their communities and helped out. Uh, this picture down here showed uh, that they were helping uh, at, in the evenings uh, deliver stuff to polling sites and to the back. So the example of why I needed them, the day after the election, one of our uh, counties had a meatpacking plant that had 300 cases of COVID uh, announced. And if that would have been the day before the election, it may have scared a whole lot of people and they wouldn't have shown up and these people could have stepped in at the last second. So this was uh, a, my insurance policy uh, to make sure uh, that uh, all of our polling stations could be staffed. So uh, get this to election day. Um, this is my whiteboard that is directly in front of me that I look at all the projects that we have to do, but I wipe it down on election day and just put the election date on it. Because as many of you, if we've done our jobs, there's really not much that we do on election day outside of managed traffic because the counties are, are getting that work done. Uh, and so my job in the first hour uh, was to make sure every polling site uh, was open. And so I had this piece of paper with a map of Nebraska, and as every county uh, came to me to say that we're open and staffed, I would put it in green. 
And at about 9.30, I tweeted out, all 1,225 precincts statewide are open. I just put that tweet out because it was my favorite reply of the entire election. This is delightfully lo-fi, and my reply, you can't hack paper in a Sharpie. So why have these fun charts when you can just have uh, a map and, uh, and a highlighter? So at 9.30, that's when I could calm down a little bit, and I knew everything was open and everything was going to be okay. So this is some of the pictures that we got after uh, of people wearing their face shields and their um, face uh, and their masks. Um, this helped a lot to make sure people felt comfortable and that they felt safe. Um, our election pretty much well unnoticed. Um, that's probably a good thing, uh, but the media seems to only want to do uh, elections that are not going well. So this was the only uh, national exposure we got the next day. Um, and I was happy to see that our, our election was a success because of uh, that turnout. So even though we're separate, it's very important to me that we have Nebraska trivia for the Sox. And I know many of you are very excited to have the Sox. So uh, in the chat function, uh, the first person to answer this question to make sure you are listening to my presentation will win the Nebraska Sox. Uh, and with that, the 2020 Nebraska primary broke the record for the most ballots cast in a primary. In what year was the previous record set? So if you were listening, you would know. Uh, first one in chat, Amy, if you could take a look at that, and I'll finish up my presentation. Uh, my counties asked for one thing. They wanted to see me in PPE. So uh, I tweeted this out on Election Day, and now I'm going to do it so no one screenshotted it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, there's my contact information, and more than willing to help you guys out as we get closer to the general. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Amy, for uh, for inviting me to speak on this. And uh, Wayne, I just recommend next time you do a commercial like that, more makeup. You need more makeup. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, we uh, this is an important uh, topic for me. I think um, you know, being a student of history, and I, I loved Wayne's. Uh, discussion about the greatest generation and how they're serving as election officers. Now, this is really an opportunity for, for our generation and younger to, uh, to serve during a, a difficult time. So um, to set the stage, we were a Super Tuesday state, had a March 3rd primary, and so we uh, escaped uh, just before the pandemic really started to light on fire. and. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have a May 5th municipal election, and 56 of our 133 localities were scheduled for that election. Um, and then, uh, but the, under the limited powers the governor has in Virginia for moving elections, uh, he was able to move the election back two weeks um, to May 19th. We also had a June 9th congressional primary scheduled, which uh, statewide Republican Senate primary. Um, and I said, it says May 23rd here, it should say June 23rd, I apologize for that, but it was also postponed two weeks under the limited authority the governor has. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is make sure that our uh, election officers had protection. So we also went out and uh, located um, personal protective equipment in the form of face masks, face shields, gloves, um, hand sanitizer, and then we also uh, purchased single-use pens and folders to the localities to use at their um, at their polling sites. Uh, we had an impossible time finding the uh, the wipes, the little wipes that they have, but we got uh, disinfectant spray and microfiber towels, essentially to wipe everything down, um, and provided uh, all of that to the localities for both the May and the June elections. The biggest success that we had, um, we have a very strong what's called Medical Reserve Corps in Virginia. And right as the pandemic started heating up, and, and uh, the governor immediately called for uh, up to 20,000 volunteers in our Medical Reserve Corps. For those of you who aren't aware, this is actually something that exists in all 50 states. It was founded after the 9 11 um, attacks. And what it is is a volunteer of medical uh, professionals. And they volunteer their time to assist during these kinds of situations, like uh, uh, when you have an earthquake or a hurricane, uh, they send them out to these locations. And definitely, uh, they've been critical in Virginia's response to the global pandemic. 
So we have over 14,000 in Virginia. We're still uh, constantly recruiting. Now, what we did was we partnered up with them. They are run through the Virginia Department of Health, and we reached out to them and started working closely with them um, and offered this service to each of our localities. Um, and so what we did was we uh, trained them on uh, how elections work in Virginia. But the most important thing, they were not, uh, they did not serve as election officers. They were there to assist the election officers in setting up the polling places to ensure safe and sanitary in-person voting. And then they also assured that they maintain sanitary conditions through the actual election. And what this really, the biggest benefit of that was it allowed the election officers to focus on actually conducting the election rather than worrying about making sure everything was wiped down. Um, some great stories that we heard, uh, one of them really stands out, is um, the election, the, I'm sorry, the, one of the volunteers from the Medical Reserve Corps came the day before the election uh, and worked with the chief officer of election in that polling place uh, to, to design the schematics. And they worked together along with the registrar uh, to ensure a smooth process for voting, but also to ensure that uh, physical distancing was ma maintained and that they could properly set up um, the location to ensure the safe and sanitary conditions. Um, we had over, uh, well over 70 of our localities uh, uh, sign up to, to work with the Medical Reserve Corps, and we had nothing but glowing reviews uh, with them uh, and the work that they did. And so this is just a, a a quick snapshot of the website that we have in Virginia. So this can be found on our Virginia Department of Health website. And then on there, they had a special page that they created specifically for volunteering to work uh, as a Medical Reserve Corps on election day in Virginia. And if you click on that message um, from the Department of Elections, uh, they, uh, the Virginia Department of Health, along with the Medical Reserve Corps, created this uh, video training. This went for our election officers. Uh, I want to reiterate that every uh, volunteer with the Medical Reserve Corps did attend an online training um, with us, and, and we spent some time working with them uh, on the elections process. But this is a video they put together for our election officers. We want to thank Virginia poll workers for their help in giving every voter a voice in this year's election. Polling sites are so important to Virginia democracy, and we appreciate you taking the responsibility to keep them functioning and safe. Your service is appreciated by all of us here in the Virginia Department of Elections. As a result of COVID-19, Election Day will look a little different this year as we take the necessary precautions to keep both voters and employees safe. People with COVID-19 have had a wide range of symptoms reported from mild symptoms to severe illness. Reports show that some people even carry the virus who never show symptoms. These symptoms include coughing, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, a fever, chills, muscle pain, a sore throat, and or a new loss of taste or smell, and may appear 48 hours to 14 days after exposure to the virus. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. The virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. When possible, incorporate social distancing strategies, increase the space between individuals, and decrease the frequency of contact among individuals to reduce the risk of spreading a disease. Keeping individuals at least six feet apart is ideal based on what is known about COVID-19. If this is not a possibility, efforts should be made to keep individuals as far apart as is practical. Feasibility of strategies will depend on the space available in the polling station and the number of voters who arrive at one time. Polling station workers can increase distance between voting booths, remind voters upon arrival to try to leave space between themselves and others, encourage voters to stay six feet apart if feasible. Polling places may provide signs to help voters and workers remember this. Discourage candidates, voters, and workers from greeting others with physical contact, like handshakes. Offer curbside voting to eligible voters. The CDC recommends wearing cloth face coverings when maintaining social distance of at least six feet if not possible, minimizing the virus's ability to transfer through respiratory droplets. 
Do not touch your face, and if wearing gloves, be sure to change them out before touching belongings like cell phones. The most effective way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 is to wash your hands frequently, followed these five steps every time. Wash your hands with clean, running water. Turn off the tap and apply soap. Lather your hands by rubbing them together with soap. Lather the backs of your hands, between your fingers and under your nail. Scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. Rinse your hands well under clean, running water. Dry your hands using a clean towel or air dry them. Disinfecting services can help to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Clean and disinfect voting associated equipment, such as voting machines, laptops, tablets, and keyboards routinely. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for all cleaning and disinfection products. Consider the use of wipeable covers for electronics. After disinfecting, dry surfaces thoroughly to avoid the pulling of liquids. Thank you again for doing your part to protect Virginia's right to vote while keeping everyone healthy and safe. You know what's going to happen? The next one's going to play. So I will get back. All right. So um, that was uh, that was thrown together pretty quickly. Uh, there's some things that we'll want to change going forward, but that was um, that was uh, uh, pretty exciting to be able to provide that to each of the uh, election officers in their uh, training prior to the May and the June elections. Um, so real quick, we'll go through and talk about kind of what we did to help recruit officers on top of all this. Uh, in Virginia, there's not a lot of leeway when it comes to combining polling places. We have a requirement that at least um, that no more than 5,000 registered voters can be established in a precinct. Um, and so combining those would mean splitting them, uh, splitting precincts. Um, and then for each precinct, you have to have at least three election officers, one from each party and a third. And then um, they must be located within one mile of the precinct line. So uh, there's very limited ability for the localities to combine their polling places. And so we were really forced to ensure that they, uh, they had enough uh, uh, election officers to conduct the election. Uh, like Nebraska, we opened all of our election um, polling places on time and with, uh, an, uh, an, with the correct number of uh, officers. But what we did was the um, uh, it, part of our recruitment efforts, uh, not only social media, et cetera, but the chief of staff for the governor's office sent a letter to all state employees encouraging them to, to sign up to become election officers. Um, the Secretary of Education sent a letter to the college presidents, as well as to superintendents in every locality, encouraging students and teachers to sign up as election officers. And then the, uh, the, uh, the Colonel in the National Guard sent, a uh, commanding officer of the National Guard sent a letter to all uh, National Guard members uh, requesting that they sign up as civilian volunteers. So this wasn't an effort for them to actually work on duty, but it, to serve in an off-duty capacity as actual election officers. That whole process uh, yielded over 1,500 applications uh, to, our, um, to our website, uh, which was a huge number uh, given, uh, given the need. Um, and so we were able to provide those informa that information to the localities in every case, they were directed to our website. Um, you can click on our website and um, fill out the form, and then we use that form and forward it on to the localities, and those localities reach out. Uh, we felt like it was a very successful program just having that. We're obviously going to need to do um, some more uh, recruiting, um, but we're going to continue in this way. One of the uh, uh, things that we're doing as part of our um, CARES Act funding and, and HAVA funding is um, reaching out and uh, developing a plan for communication to encourage people to serve as election officers going forward. So that was the story in Virginia. And if you need to reach out to me, I'm Rob Rock with the Kentucky State Board of Elections. Thank you, Chris. Um, so now uh, we'll go to questions as a reminder. Um, you can raise your hand to ask a question or you can type a question in the chat box. 
Um, I did get one question for Ryan. Um, because work election is work elections is part of the fair elections center um, and fair election center does uh, litigate against states. Um, how do you uh, keep those efforts separate? Mm -hmm. So uh, the staff that work on the staff that work on fair elections are different than um, like we have legal staff that do all sorts um, of other things. I'm the project manager for work elections, um, and so I'm not involved with uh, any litigation. Um, so yeah, they're two distinct um, project or two distinct areas of the organization. Thank you. Do we have other questions for our panelists? Ryan, I have one more question for you, which is how does work elections store any of the data that people are entering or, or uh, is that data just entered on state or local websites? Yeah, um, we currently work elections. Um, we have a survey that is like an optional thing to, for people to give feedback about the site, but um, as it's currently constituted, we don't collect information on people that use um, that use work elections. Power the polls, which is the new site I was talking about, that um, I think is going to in the coming weeks become like the centerpiece of recruitment efforts. Um, that one is um, collects much more information in order to do all the follow up that I mentioned. So. Um, when people go to the website, they are asked if they're if they're interested in serving and finding out how to get involved to provide contact information and you know their location, um, and and so th that um, that website collects more information from individuals. Work elections is going to remain up and up to date throughout you know the fall as well, so um, people can use that if they'd like. Um, uh, and, and yeah, we, we don't collect, um, we don't have people fill out applications on our site and then send them along, as I mentioned. It's all very much trying to just direct people where to go. I have a question here uh, in the chat uh, from uh, a state that I think uh, is sort of broadly <laughs> across states. Um, are you able to tell states which of their local election jurisdictions have provided information to you? Um, yes, uh, we we definitely could uh, provide that um, over the course of you know the past six months. It's been a mixture of we've received survey responses and then we've also done a lot of direct outreach to people who we hadn't heard from. So. Um, if you contact me, we can um, we can put that we can look into who who's reached out to us and who we've we've followed up with individually. Um, and one other question that I think I'm asking on behalf of a lot of people: um, Can you link to the state website that has each county's job application site? Yeah. So um, on the homepage. In the top right corner, there are a bunch of tabs. One of them is labeled states. If you select that, you're brought to a list of all the state pages. And each of those state pages will, um, will list out all the jurisdictions we have information on. So um, in, the, in the cases of states that, do it, that, uh, that organize or recruit poll workers by county, we have uh, all the counties. Um, the states that do it by municipality, um, currently we have a cap on how small of a municipality we have info on. Um, so in, uh, for example, in uh, Michigan, we have all towns above 10,000 people currently. Um, and hopefully in, in the future, we will be able to add the, the for info for smaller municipalities, but, um, but we prioritize the larger ones. So those are all listed on the state pages. 
Great. I see a question here from Jared. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and go right ahead? All right, Rob Rock from Rhode Island. Uh, I had a question for Chris and uh, Wayne. Um, I I'm wondering if you guys had, how much attrition did you guys have for your poll workers uh, on election day? So if you guys did this massive recruiting effort, which is amazing, both of you guys did an incredible job. Um, what did that look like on election day on, on attrition? And I, I think the other two part, uh, second part of that question is, um, was it hard if you had to replace a lot of poll workers on election day, were you able to, to adequately train them so that you weren't having issues on election day? I'll take that one first. Um, I will say on election day, we, we didn't have to fill many spots because by that Friday or that weekend, we knew we were in a good spot. Uh, I will say the counties that did have uh, subs, they're all trained as well. So um, every person that volunteered that went to the polling site got trained prior to going there, even at getting an online uh, version of the training uh, the weekend before the election or the day before the election. Um, and one thing I didn't point out during my uh, remarks that I wanted to say is that we did get guidance right off the bat that poll workers uh, who were unemployed, this, um, this money was not going to go against their unemployment benefits. And also for the National Guard members that were activated, uh, their pay, they got paid by the National Guard for their normal day of duty, that if they're in their normal job uh, did, was laid off, uh, they would not be affected by their unemployment as well. Um, but every person that volunteered in order to go had to be trained, and we worked with the counties either online or what have you the weekend before to make sure everyone was good. Yeah, uh, we have a requirement that they all have to be trained before uh, they can serve. Um, I don't have the hard numbers, Jared, but we, we had, a, I would say, about 25% attrition. Um, I know we have the numbers, and I'm happy to get those for you, um, but um, the localities that had the worst attrition were able to, in some cases, uh, combine their polling places, and then um, uh, uh, we were in the same boat as, as Nebraska. We were able to get out guidance right away um, to let uh, the poll workers know that if they were unemployed, that they could still um, they could they could serve and get paid without uh, it affecting their their uh, unemployment. But yeah, we we at the end of the day um, had more than enough uh, poll workers uh, as a result. But it was um, it it was uh, a little scary. We also benefited from. Uh, the, the timing of our elections, our, uh, Virginia moved into phase one um, on May, I think May 12th, just the week before we start, had the May elections, and then we were already into phase two when we got to uh, uh, the June election. So people felt a little bit more comfortable, and, and we didn't have a huge attrition on election day itself. I see a question in the chat here um, for uh, both Chris and Wayne. Um, if any state, uh, if, if either of you had poll workers who got COVID from working that you're aware of. We are, uh, we are not aware of that. Um, the, the scariest thing we saw was a, um, and I brought this up in our call earlier, but uh, we had a general registrar and their assistant um, the general registrar was, was uh, um, diagnosed with COVID and forced into quarantine for 14 days, uh, and the assistant was uh, sent to quarantine for 14 days, and that was all uh, a week before the election. So, um, but we're not aware of at this point in time of any um, anybody or poll workers reporting. Um, wait, no, I, I take that back. We did have one where they were reported. Um, and, uh, and then we're, they're following up, but I haven't heard anything. It was just one in uh, a rural locality. And, uh, we didn't have any reports. Um, I counted the days for two weeks after the election to hear about, and, uh, we didn't hear anything coming from the polling sites based upon our planning, you know, it ended up being, um, I think 70, I think I said 70,000 voters, a bunch of their polls. So you divide that by 1225 precincts divided by 
13 hours, it was an average of six people an hour, so social distancing was easy. Um, so um, just by the mere fact that we encourage early voting, not a whole lot of people went to their polling site, social distancing was easy, so we, we were hopeful that there wasn't any. I had one uh, National Guard member that had to be tested, but it was negative, um, so I, I uh, um, we were very lucky. Um, we have a question in the chat from David in Minnesota. Um, did either of you hear any pushback from voters refusing to wear masks? And if so, um, how did you handle that? Um, we did not require the use of masks. We had them available for all the voters that wanted them. Um, we, I, I got, I got some, um, a lot of voter advocacy groups ask, well, why aren't you requiring this? Why aren't you requiring this? Well, we have a clause in our constitution that there's no impediment to the right to vote, and it is often used by voter advocacy groups to say why we should not have voter ID, because that's an impediment. So I, so I told all of them the same uh, constitutional provision that you are saying that we can't have voter ID, I can't require to have a mask. Um, and so we did have a few poll workers that um, tried to require it and we would get calls and we'd have to let them know that no, we can't require them to have a mask. But um, for the most part, it, it did run smoothly, but there were some people that refused. Um, and I took those phone calls, but and based upon our looking at the constitution, there was something we couldn't require. Yeah, that was a, the same in Virginia. We, we um, the guidance out to the localities, but they couldn't require uh, a voter to wear a mask for the same reason. There shouldn't be any impediment, or there cannot be any impediment to voting. Um, for the most part, I think we heard a lot of compliance. Um, uh, we did have election officers who didn't want to wear masks. Um, and so, unfortunately, that was a locality decision as well. Um, and we're looking at that a little bit closer uh, for, for November. But um, I didn't hear any real pushback. It was a real low turnout in um, both elections. Um, but uh, there certainly was some um, some concern leading up to it, but nothing really on election day. Do we have other questions either uh, in the chat or if someone wants to raise their hand? I have a question for Ryan about Power of the Polls, which I recognize is not uh, your website, but since you're partnering with them, I'm curious um, what they're doing right now with the information that they are collecting. Um, the people who say that they want to be a poll worker, how that information is being communicated to election officials. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not muted. Here, yep, you go. you're good. Um, currently, um, it is people who sign up through the website uh, will get an email sent to them, um, you know, thanking them for their interest and directing them uh, that they'll be receiving more information in the near future about how to get involved in their locality. Um, and it also includes a link to work elections right now. Um, I think the plan is in the next few weeks to link all the data that we have in work elections so that it, um, the, the, the messages that get sent to people have jurisdiction specific info in the communications. Um, but I am not, because um, I'm not wor working on that directly, I don't have um, more details at the moment, uh, but uh, like I said, in the next couple of weeks, that will be, um, those will be built out. Great, thank you. All right. Um, well, I think that wraps up um, our first session. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Lori, would you like to introduce um, the second panel and I'll pass the baton? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Ryan, Wayne, and Chris. That was uh, really timely and very informative. We appreciate your time this morning. Uh, next, we're going to hear uh, from panelists who are going to talk about accessibility during COVID-19. 
Um, I am uh, pleased to welcome Michelle Bishop from uh, the Disability Advocate. She's a Disability Advocacy Specialist uh, for Voting Rights with the National Disability Rights Network. I joined a presentation with their group, I don't know, sometime in the last few weeks. Um, and really, uh, and, and Michelle actually joined us at our conference in February. So we're pleased to have Michelle back with us today. Uh, we're also going to hear from Karen Brinson Bell, the Executive Director from North Carolina State Board of Elections. And you're also going to, uh, you're stuck with me for at least 15 minutes to talk about um, uh, accessibility during a pandemic. So, uh, Michelle, I think we'll start with you. Take it away. Webex and I are not friends, y'all. <laughs> we are not. It doesn't matter how long I work from home. We are not friends. All right, we're all set. Thanks, you all, for bearing with me for a minute there. As you heard, my name is Michelle Bishop, and I'm the Voting Rights Specialist at the National Disability Rights Network. I have joined you all a couple times. You keep having me back. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, Lori, we were so thrilled to have you at our annual conference. She is being very, very subtle about it. She actually was, like, the kickoff speaker for our big institute on COVID and elections, like, on the first day. She was, like, one of the very first speakers, and she crushed it, of course. Well, so you can see the slides I've got here. I decided to call this Chaos COVID-19 and Accessible Elections because chaos to me seems the right word for any year that features both a global pandemic that we haven't seen in 100 years and something called murder hornets, right? Um, 2020, not really anyone's year. I'm going to talk you quickly through uh, some of our recommendations, all of which we've put out in public statements uh, for what we want to see for accessible elections during the pandemic for the, you know, as we go through the rest of 2020 and we all hang in there. Um, hopefully, if you're looking at some of this and you're thinking, Michelle, duh, that's what we're going for, right? That means we're probably on the same page. We've probably got a good plan together. Um, but I'm also happy to kind of talk about any of this and take questions uh, when, when we wrap up. So let's jump right into it. Uh, it's a little bit of, of everything that we have kind of in our public recommendations. Let's start with the less obvious. I think everyone knows that um, ma mail-in voting is coming, right, as part of our recommendations. So let's start by talking about in-person voting. Um, one of the things I want to stress, and that I think probably most of you know, is that voting by mail does not work for everyone. There's very good reason it's such a popular option right now, but we know that it doesn't work for everyone. And that includes people who live in extremely rural areas, people on Native American reservations, people who need various types of language access, as well as people with disabilities for whom we've yet to make those systems fully accessible, fully ADA compliant. Uh, so for that reason, we believe it is important to maintain in-person voting to the greatest extent possible. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail because yes, we realize that's no easy task this year. And of course, we recommend following the CDC and other safety guidelines, right? Having as much PPE as we can have on hand uh, social distancing, face masks, plastic shields, hand sanitizer, hand washing stations, uh, whatever we can find to make that in-person voting option, of course, as safe as possible. A little more detail on what that means. I want to stress first, we understand there will not be enough polling places. We understand completely that for many of you, that is going to be a huge challenge. We also agree that there are some types of locations like residential facilities that should not serve as polling places in 2020. This is something we're hearing commonly. I bet a lot of you are having this experience that residential facilities like nursing homes were common polling places. And under normal circumstances, they can actually be a great polling place because that means the residents who live there have a real easy time voting and that it's likely an accessible location for others who live in the community. But at this time, they have an obligation to protect their residents and facilities like these have been hit hard by COVID-19 in many cases. So they just simply can't afford to open their doors. So we understand it's gonna be harder to find polling places. We understand finding accessible polling places is gonna be a challenge. That said, polling locations still have to be compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It, it still applies even in times like these. What can we do about that? Of things we'd recommend to the greatest sense extent that you're able, maintaining proximity to previous locations and to transit options whenever possible, so that it's not uh, significantly more taxing for voters to get to a location if the location where they previously would have voted is not available to you this year. 
Temporary modifications to polling places are probably going to be critical. I imagine a lot of you are looking at using new locations, maybe less than ideal locations, maybe locations you wouldn't have picked. If you had more options, we completely understand those types of same day modifications that are low cost and really boost your ADA compliance are gonna be really important here. We actually have a lot of resources on that. Prior to a global pandemic breaking out, we had actually released a report called Blocking the Ballot Box that looked at polling place closures. And to the extent that they were largely in the media being blamed on the Americans with Disabilities Act and enforcement of the ADA by the Department of Justice uh, and really defending the work that you all are doing to try to make your polling places accessible and keep them open. That actually has a lot of resources in there on how the ADA applies and how to do some temporary low cost modifications. Things like that could be helpful right now and we'd love to provide it. I'm also gonna say this and I know some of y'all love this and some of y'all will hate it, but allow for curbside voting everywhere. I can't stress this enough. There are many voters for whom the ability to limit their exposure to COVID-19 is going to be the single biggest factor in how they cast their ballots, right? People with disabilities and voters in general are such a broad group of people and we're all very different. Uh, for some voters, you know, the ability to use a DRE or a ballot marking device is the biggest factor in whether or not their vote is gonna work for them. But for someone who has a condition where they're immunosuppressed, they need to be able to limit their exposure. That's gonna mean voting by mail, or when that's not possible, like say if the ballot doesn't get there on time, which is a problem we've already seen in some primaries, they may have to go in person and the ability to stay in a vehicle and limit their exposure to others is gonna be critical, especially when we're looking at polling locations that are indoor. We're trying to limit our congestion so we can socially distance. We really think curbside voting could be very beneficial. It may also come into play if you are using a lot of newer locations for your polling places that maybe aren't quite up to snuff when it comes to the ADA guidelines for polling places. This is an important stopgap measure that the Department of Justice does allow to ensure a greater level of accessibility when you have no choice but to use a less than ideal location. All right, so let's get into remote voting. Uh, the topic of the year for election 2020, we are recommending allowing all voters to opt to use whatever absentee mail-in remote voting options are available. Um, places where there's no excuses absentee, to be quite honest, we want to, we want to see no excuses absentee. We don't want to see an excuse. Uh, if there is an excuse, COVID-19 should be one, uh, so that anyone who needs to can access those remote voting options. We'd also love to see sort of a relaxing of the process here. These are difficult times. I can't imagine how difficult they are for you. Not much easier for your voters, right? Extending deadlines as much as possible to accommodate them, being able to make a decision about how best to vote, get in an application, get in a ballot, and also dropping requirements for things like witness signatures and notaries. This is something that can be really critical to people with disabilities. I talked a little bit about people who are immunosuppressed or who are at greatest risk for complications related to COVID-19. For some voters, it is critical that they be able to limit their exposure to others. If they are self-isolating for good reason, we don't want anyone to have to break that to get witnesses, to get a notary. It could be actually quite difficult to find a notary at this time. If you're somewhere where we haven't fully reopened or where, quite frankly, before November, you may be reclosing uh, a lot of your places of public accommodation. We think this is just good practice. Some of these things are barriers for people with disabilities in normal times. We certainly don't want it to be a barrier now. Um, providing absentee ballots with self-sealing envelopes and stamped envelopes for ballot return. Um, we love this as a best practice in general. Myself included, not everyone has stamps at home. And certainly if the COVID numbers are gonna keep rising in such a large number of states, going out to get that envelope to get that stamp in itself can be a barrier or a risk point for certain types of voters. We'd like to see accessibility information included in the ballot package. Uh, as much as you see recommendations to mail a ballot to everyone, mail it with a self-sealing stamped envelope, uh, coming from a lot of different organizations, which I think is true, they don't all necessarily include this point about including the accessibility information up front. If you have other options for cast, accessing, accessing casting your ballot or uh, accessing other languages, we want that information provided to any automatic mailings that go out to your voters. You want to establish additional drop sites 
for completed absentee ballots, especially if you have a limited number of locations and make sure that they're gonna be fully accessible, uh, which I know can be difficult. Um, <laughs> I think I'm getting towards the end here. Uh, allowing all voters to use remote accessible um, ballot marking and electronic balloting system. This is probably the most controversial recommendation we have, but it could very well be the most important. For many people with disabilities, the ability to receive, mark, verify, and cast that ballot using electronic means is going to be the best way for them to vote in 2020. And quite frankly, the only way, really, that we're making vote by mail systems fully accessible. If you are only mailing a piece of paper to be handmarked to your voters, that is not in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is not accessible to all of your voters. Anyone who's not capable of doing that in a polling place can't do it at their kitchen table either. Uh, I know there's somewhat of an expectation that maybe they'll receive assistance, they do have the right to a private and independent ballot. And like I said, these might be folks who are isolating for a very good reason in the context of the pandemic. So we need that privacy and independence are actually really, really crucial right now uh, for even more pressing reasons than we've seen in other elections. So it's critical that we are able to adopt electronic balloting systems now for our remote voting. Um, electronic delivery of a blank ballot is sort of, a, in my mind, a better than nothing option. Uh, if I can receive it and mark it electronically, that's helpful. The moment when I have to print it and be able to handle that paper, verify that paper, return that paper, that's inaccessibility that we're introducing to the system. Fully electronic processes are honestly much more accessible. So this is something worth taking a look at. If you don't already have a system in place uh, for your absentee voters, what do you maybe have in place for your old Cava voters that could be leveraged here? Um, and allowing any designated voter assistance Voters have the right to be assistant of their choice uh, under the Voting Rights Act, of course, with a limited number of exceptions here, employer and union rep, to actually pick up the absentee ballot, return the completed ballot, any of those things in these times that might help someone to, to limit their exposure and allow them to be able to cast that ballot. So if you want more, I've included here NDRN statement that includes all this and a little bit more detail. Uh, I should stress, we actually have a new statement that just came out. Uh, so I don't have it in here. We actually did a joint statement with the ACLU that actually has even more detail. And you know what, I'll actually go ahead and share with Amy. We can make sure we get that into all of your hands as well. It's up online. I also put where you can find our member organizations. NDRN is a national membership association. We are federally mandated. So we have an affiliate in every state, district, and territory in the United States, and they're funded through HAVA to work on access to the vote. So if there, you want to talk to people with disabilities about how best to do this, what they're looking for, what would be accessible to them, our network is available to you and we'd love to do that. You can also reach out directly to me. You have my email here, happy to talk about it, happy to help. And so in summary, if I were to say, what is our 2020 election plan in my mind? All voters are very different, especially right now, in terms of what's gonna be most accessible and safest for that voter, whether or not it's limiting your exposure or having access to things like ballot marking devices, electronic delivery systems. So I believe in a give them everything but the kitchen sink model. Let's have as many options for voting as possible. Let's have walk up voting at polling places that might have to be converted to vote centers, to be honest. Let's have drive up or curbside voting at those locations as well. Let's mail everyone a ballot Let's also have an electronic option for those mailed ballots. Everything but the kitchen sink. And then of course, I have to stress, having a robust voter education and notification plan with multiple accessible formats. A lot of changes are coming quickly. That's just part of the necessity of the situation we find ourselves in, but we need voters to know what their options are, especially if we want them to leverage those options. So making sure voters know what's coming. This means, you know, print materials that are in standard print, large print, braille, electronic materials that are up on your website, preferably not a PDF, HTML is way more accessible. But this also means getting on the local news, getting on the local radio, making sure we're getting that message out there as much as we possibly can. And that was quick, so I'm happy to answer questions later, but everything I got for you today, thanks everybody. Okay, good morning still and good afternoon again. Uh, today I am joining you to talk about um, how Washington is serving voters living with disabilities during a pandemic. Um, but first, I wanna share just a little bit about Washington. Uh, we have just over 4.5 million voters here in Washington. We're expecting that to uh, go over the 5 million point, fingers, or 5 million point, uh, fingers crossed, 
uh, this year. We are divided into uh, 39 counties here in Washington. Um, I always like to say, too, that we've had online voter registration since 2007. Uh, we have uh, electronic interfaces with DOL for uh, years, which are now real time and are adding uh, other agencies this week. So pretty excited about that. Uh, we're proud founding members of ERIC and we produce a printed electronic and audio voters pamphlet every year. Um, we're divided among, uh, we have 520 ballot drop sites across Washington, uh, 60 voting centers, and this year we'll be adding 10 college hubs um, and are, are uh, working with our colleges across Washington to identify what that's going to look like um, in a COVID environment. Um, most of you know that uh, vote by mail is one of my most very favorite things to talk about. Um, Washington is a vote by mail state. Um, we voted entirely by mail since uh, 2011. Uh, and as I said, with drop boxes and voting centers uh, located across the state with more to come for our general election. Uh, voters in Washington can submit uh, online mailed applications that have to be received, uh, sorry, they can submit uh, by mail or an online application that have to be received eight days before each election. Uh, but voters now can register or update their registration through 8 p.m. on election day. That has to be done in person at any voting center or hub across the state, even um, voters, uh, even when voters are outside of their county. So uh, we definitely expect that the number of in-person transactions at our voting centers and hubs uh, this year, it was going to be high anyway, but will definitely increase uh, with the number of folks that are um, waiting until the last minute to either get registered or update their registration. Uh, we do provide an 18-day voting period for our voters, and voters can vote at uh, vote centers or college hubs for early voting and election day. Um, additionally, again, as I said, we have ballot drop boxes located throughout the state. Um, we also offer postage paid envelopes for those who are choosing to return by mail. Uh, and we have an online accessible replacement ballot option that is available on demand for any voter in the state, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, so what's different this year? Uh, we're working to ensure proper health standards and procedures for our voting centers and our accessible voting units. Um, things like adding plexi, signage, uh, PPE, um, I've also kind of written down about hand washing stations. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I should have thought about that, so I appreciated hearing Michelle recommend that as an option. So I'll be reaching out to my counties to make sure um, that they look into purchasing those with their CARES Act funding as well. Uh, we gave the majority, the vast majority of our CARES funding directly to the counties so that they could prepare uh, for uh, COVID-19 impacts to voting centers, hubs, as well as their office locations. Um, we're working to expand the number of voting sites and ballot drop boxes. Um, we think expanding is probably the more appropriate thing rather than reducing for us this year, particularly with that um, in-person deadline happening uh, on election day now. Um, we also have counties that are finding alternate locations to do ballot processing so that they can ensure social distancing among their staff. Um, we're also working to recruit reserves of additional staff with our vote squad effort uh, to support ballot processing and voting center operations. I've already had to quarantine um, half of my team. Uh, I've split into team one and team two, and this is just going to be our new norm. And so having uh, reserves of staff that can come in and support these operations, whether it's your back office operation or your voting center operation is going to be key this year. Um, and we're expanding our social media campaign. I like that Michelle touched on our need to be um, reaching out with um, quick messages. We're trying to get folks to register early so that they can avoid having to stand in line at a voting center on election day. So register early, register at home, update your registration early um, with DOL offices being closed or by appointment only. Um, definitely working to ensure that we're getting the word out, whether it's um, Spotify ads or uh, YouTube ads or radio and radio in multiple languages all across the state 
um, really just trying to reach folks where they are with these messages um, and having a different, um, a different message at those different phases during the um, election process. We have our primary coming up on August 4th. Uh, so we have a little bit, we have an opportunity to practice uh, these messages uh, in our primary and see what works and see where we can have some improvements before uh, we get into our uh, general election later this year. Um, and more messaging to come, again, as um, uh, really looking at uh, promoting social distancing and using proper PPE uh, when voting in person. Uh, we offer self, online self-serve accessible tools for our voters, and we certainly expect expanded use of these tools due to COVID-19. Uh, we launched our VoteWA application, oh my gosh, it's uh, just been over a year now. Um, and uh, through VoteWA, voters can uh, check their voter registration status. Uh, they can update their registration or register to vote. Uh, they can access their voter's guide or find a voting center or a ballot drop box. Uh, but additionally, through VoteWA, voters can access a replacement ballot from anywhere 24 hours a day. Uh, they can use their own assistive tech to read and mark their ballot, and then they'll print and sign the declaration page and return the packet. Uh, sorry, Michelle, haven't quite got all the way to uh, your recommendation. Uh, but we do think it's important to have um, a 24-hour self-service tool that voters can access uh, in their homes, particularly this year, um, that can be used with their own assistive tech uh, to, to, ca to um, mark their ballot. Um, because we certainly recognize that a hand-marked paper ballot doesn't serve all communities well, um, particularly some voters that are living with disabilities. So we offer this at-home service as an option. Um, as well as in-person services. We certainly recognize that um, closing down locations um, just because of COVID-19 isn't really an option for us, um, particularly when those in-person activities um, that happen on election day just really can't be done in a remote environment uh, well. Let's see. Um, additionally, a voter can print a PDF of their ballot if they prefer and then mark that at home. Um, and then they sign the declaration sheet and return by mail or take it to a ballot drop site or a voting center. Uh, ballots here in Washington have to be postmarked by election day if they're mailed. Um, and as a security measure with uh, vote by mail or with using any of these tools, all of the signature on, signatures on ballot declarations must be verified by trained personnel before a ballot can be counted. And if a signature doesn't match, voters still have an opportunity to cure it and have their uh, ballot counted uh, before the certification of the election. Uh, voters can also uh, use VoteWA to request a replacement ballot by mail uh, if they don't want to use the um, replacement ballot option that's online. Uh, but they can also use this tool to check the status of their ballot uh, if they have already returned it. Um, voters can access their personalized online voters guide using VoteWA. Um, this voters guide is also recorded by the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. Um, Watabel is part of the Secretary of State's office, so we love that we have that um, built-in connection with our office already to be able to serve, uh, serve all communities. Um, and then the audio recording is distributed to voters or they can just access the audio version uh, online 24 hours a day directly from our website. Our 2020 primary, again, is August 4th. That's already available online in audio and in four languages. Um, and our 2020 general election printed voters pamphlet will be mailed to all households in Washington um, as well as offered online. Um, I think now more than ever, it's important to continue building partnerships with all communities. In fact, just this morning, we held our, um, our DAC meeting, our Disability Advisory Committee meeting. Um, Disability Rights Washington is an active partner um, in our Disability Advisory Committee. Um, I think working together to ensure that voter registration is available, um, working with those get out the vote messages and to provide access to information is super important. It's always important, um, but in, in light of the changes that are happening um, and in light of um, just COVID-19, 
really we think it's important to continue communicating so that we can remove those barriers and demystify what's happening with elections. So uh, again, as I said, we have our own state disability advisory committee uh, that meets uh, at least four times a year. Um, we have uh, a partnership with our governor's committee on disability issues and employment. Um, we work with accessible communities advisory committees all across Washington that are embedded in, um, in every county across Washington and those have a, um, I love what they can do. They can actually um, fine people um, and collect fines for people who are parking uh, illegally in, um, in um, spots for, in disability spots and then they can take those fees that are collected and use them to improve um, access to voting uh, in the local community and that is done through the Accessible Communities Advisory Committee um, and elections is a component of that. So it's kind of a cool thing that's happening here in Washington to help uh, promote accessibility. Uh, we also work with the American Association of People with Disabilities uh, and as I said, work closely with Disability Rights Washington. Uh, we also, uh, we are the pass-through agency that works with TVW, our um, government station, and um, we uh, work with them to fund the production and captioning of a video voter's guide uh, for candidates that uh, we provide access to on our website. And then next week is Get Out the Disability Vote Week, uh, and we celebrate that every year. Um, it looks a little different this year. We were hoping um, that we would be talking today with our DAC about all of the efforts that we would be promoting next week, um, and uh, they, they won't be rolling out in the same way that uh, we had certainly expected. So sad about that. Um, and then, of course, we always work a component into National Voter Registration Day as well. Um, so that is the end. Um, I would just say we pride ourselves on the work that we do every day, whether we're in a pandemic or not, um, and working to provide robust online tools, providing a ballot to every registered voter by mail weeks before every election, uh, providing a printed voter's pamphlet mailed to every household available in multiple languages um, while providing that in accessible formats as well, postage-free elections, universal same-day voter registration across Washington State, um, and then those at-home options and in-person options um, that each voter can really choose to use. Um, and really focusing on that all to balance, balance the needs of our voters um, while we're ensuring that our elections are secure. So again, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to that phase of the discussion. Great. Thanks for letting me talk about North Carolina's curbside voting process. Uh, North Carolina has been doing curbside voting um, at our one-stop early voting locations and our election day polling places since the early 2000s. Um, that means we provide curbside voting for a voter um, at any of our 2,700 plus or minus uh, polling locations and anywhere um, up to 500 one-stop one early voting sites. So, um, and this is not specific because of that time frame. Um, this is something we've been providing outside of a pandemic or coronavirus. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we're adapting this process uh, with regards to the pandemic. Just as an overview, um, curbside is, as I mentioned, provided uh, at any of our in-person voting locations. It is available to any voter who is unable to enter a polling place that could be, and they can attest to whether it's because of their age or a physical disability, something that prohibits them from coming into the polling place. Um, it, the, the attestation is part of our poll book document that we call an authorize, authorization to vote form. Uh, that may look different in different states, but that is a document that we either print or uh, have pre-printed uh, to provide to voters as our poll book. Um, the person who brings an individual to curbside vote, um, it, the curbside voter may, you know, transport, drive themselves to the polling place, and that's certainly fine, but often um, they would be driven by someone else. And uh, it is our state law that that other individual, the person you may have driven, um, would not be able to curbside vote unless they attest as well that they're unable to enter the polling place um, due to one of the uh, provisions. 
we do curbside voting in designated parking spaces uh, with an alert system, a bell, something of that nature. Um, and it is separate from handicapped parking spaces. We recognize that individuals who may make use of a handicapped parking space may choose to come into the polling place. And so we assure that, as Michelle said, that they meet ADA compliance and are accessible for those individuals. So curbside is set apart from the handicapped parking spaces. The supplies are pretty simple. Um, what's needed to conduct curbside voting, uh, and this is actually a, a photo of one of our recent sites. We had a uh, second primary or a runoff, um, as some folks refer to it, uh, in 17 of our counties on June the 23rd. Um, that was postponed from May the 12th because of COVID. And this is two of those poll workers setting up one of those alert systems that I mentioned. Uh, you can also see their signage indicating that if they, the alert system doesn't work for some reason, how they can contact that polling place uh, to, to have their you know, poll worker come out and conduct uh, curbside voting for them. Uh, other signage is needed to make sure that people understand what curbside voting is and that it's not meant for handicapped parking spaces um, and it's not meant for just general parking. Um, so you've got the signage, you've got the alert system, you need to make sure you have adequate parking um, because you will be you know, separating these spaces out from the other parking that voters would use. You have to have at least one dedicated election official in our state, in some counties, in some polling places because of the size or the, the volume of use. Um, they'll have additional election officials designated. You have to have a, a poll book form or some method that can be transported out to the curbside voter. We also uh, utilize a privacy sleeve. Um, this can be as simple as a manila envelope, but quite often we try to use um, a more, more like a plastic sleeve um, to ensure the privacy of the ballot as it's being transported into the polling place. Um, and of course, you have to have the ballot. As we deal with curbside voting during a pandemic, however, we're looking at additional considerations. Uh, you can see in this photo, our worker was uh, wearing gloves and a mask. Um, the voter appeared with a mask. Uh, we would have offered a mask to them if they had chosen um, or, or wanted, uh, but this person happened to, to show up with a mask. Um, we have been using sanitizing materials, uh, just as we have within the polling place, to make sure that that clipboard that you see, the pins that you see, um, all of those things are sanitized. Uh, and being rotated. We don't have a single clipboard and a single pen. Uh, we provided one-time use pens to the curbside voters just as we did uh, to our other voters, and we'll continue to do that in November. Um, all the health and safety measures that we're doing inside of the polling place, is, that's being done as well for um, curbside. And the other things that we're having to consider are an increase in demand um, because someone who has asthma, it may not be apparent, but they can attest to the fact that they are unable to come into the polling place because that might compromise their immune system if they're exposed to uh, COVID-19, for example. And then just trying to get the messaging out. Um, we have consistently made it known that curbside voting is available in North Carolina, but we're needing to make sure that that message is out um, very clearly for this election. And so through our voter guide, um, our website, our social media, our, our training, and things of that nature will continue to make sure that voters know that this is an option for them. Um, it was, you know, an anecdotal type thing is because of the June 23rd uh, second primary not being a high turnout type of election, um, many thought that polling locations might not be open, and so they thought that curbside was their only option. Um, but you know, quickly realized once the person came up to them at their window that they could still come in. Most did opt to continue to come into the polling place. Um, so that was a, a situation that we'll still have to message. Um, I think November's turnout will be a clear indication that the polling places are open um, and that they all aren't going to be curbside voting. All right, so this is a video I'm going to play for you. Um, Amy, help me know if the audio is coming through okay. Um, one of our counties, are actually our largest in voting population, Wake County, uh, put together this training video. At the beginning, you're going to see a, 
a handful of snapshot type Polaroids because those are the different chapters of their training program videos. Um, so this is one of their chapters. Uh, but I thought this would be the best way to describe how the process actually works and, um, and you don't have to see me the whole time. Curbside voting allows voters who are unable to enter the voting enclosure due to age or physical disability to vote in their vehicles. As a curbside official, you do not need to memorize the steps to process a voter. The steps are printed on the curbside privacy sleeve. Inside the voting enclosure, officials listen to the curbside bell. Then the official collects supplies they'll need to take to the voter's vehicle. This includes the authorization to vote form, also referred to as the ATV, which contains the curbside affidavit on the front. At the vehicle, the official reads the curbside oath to the voter. Then the official asks the voter to complete and sign Section B of the ATV. Next, the official asks the voter to state their name and address. The curbside official repeats the voter's information. After repeating the voter's information, the official signs Section B of the ATV. The curbside official returns to the voting enclosure. The registration table official confirms the voter's information matches the voter's poll book label and affixes the label to the ATV. Note that in some cases, it may be necessary for the curbside official to visit the help table. The curbside official proceeds to the ballot table. The ballot table official issues the ballot and records the ballot style on the ATV. The official returns to the vehicle and asks the voter to review the information on the poll book label. The voter signs Section A of the ATV, and then the official steps away from the vehicle. The curbside official initials Section A of the ATV while the voter completes the ballot and places it inside the curbside privacy sleeve. Once the ballot has been marked, the official asks the voter to wait until the official returns to the voting enclosure. Back inside the voting enclosure, the curbside official asks the chief judge or a judge to place the ballot in the tabulator, and the curbside official also receives the I voted sticker. Before returning to the vehicle, the curbside official takes the ATV to the ballot table to be sequentially numbered and placed on the spindle. Finally, the official returns to the vehicle and reports that the ballot has been accepted by the tabulator and issues the I voted sticker. And curbside voting really is that simple of a process. I think the most challenging is when it's raining, finding an election official who is willing to take on that role um, and also the steps that they're going to take. Uh, that's a lot of steps, but that's, the, that's a very thorough process of how um, the counties and the polling places and the election officials actually um, administer curbside voting. Um, and no, not every polling, uh, not every voter shows up in a convertible and makes it easy during COVID-19. So um, with that, um, I've, here's my contact, oh, sorry, <laughs> here's my contact information and my email. I'm happy to answer questions. Amy also has, um, I've provided her recently with um, materials from numerous counties in our state so that it's not just from our largest county who has, you know, clever videos. Um, and so those are available uh, as well to NASA members. So thank you. Karen, my question for you is, um, and does every county use like a fancy doorbell? Are there other ways to sort of notify? <laughs> yes, yeah. um, there are different uh, products out there through election vendors primarily um, because you know it, it is a a service, a method that's offered, so they have them specific for elections. 
Um, some have a radio signal, some have the, um, you may have noticed the hose similar to what you know, full service gas stations offer or used to offer. Um, and so those are typical. There are some polling places that have so much, um, have so many windows in front that they can just visibly see. And then we've had some who have started you know, stationing someone um, closer to the door or even outside with a tent or something to, to help monitor. So it, it, it doesn't have to be the alert system. Um, we find that to be the most effective and the one that you know, is most commonly used just because of the polling locations. And about how much, how long does a transaction take? Um, it's it's actually pretty quick because you know we usually let that election official um, move to the front of the line or go to the help station um, to process if we need to. Uh, so really, it comes down to just the period of time that it takes with um, you know just that walking and then the length of the ballot. Um, so, you know, if, if on a ele presidential election, we have usually over 20 contests or up to 20 contests on a ballot. So, you know, a voter is going to be in the polling place um, you know, from the time they check in to the time they mark their ballot in anywhere from six to 10 minutes. Um, that's probably what you're looking at with a curbside voter as well, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I'll also say that one of the things that we've been able to do, and we'll have to figure out how to best address this. Um, in with a pandemic situation uh, is that a lot of the care facilities will actually let the Board of Elections know that they're coming um, to a one-stop early voting site and we will conduct curbside voting for all of those residents or patients from a care facility um, on their, you know, their 15 passenger van or their small bus or whatever they use to transfer those individuals. And um, so that is something we try to do as a coordinated effort and that of course takes longer um, just because of the number of people you're trying to serve. Great. I see uh, Bob Giles from New Jersey. You raised your hand. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my question's for Michelle. Hello, Michelle. Um, so now that we're moving more towards vote by mail, we experience this in New Jersey with uh, electronic ballot delivery does not seem to be an issue for folks, but it's the electronic ballot return that uh, uh, there's obviously a lot of security concerns and, and controversy with electronic ballot return. So my question is, where do you guys stand on, you know, we, we send a ballot to a voter with a disability. They get to, to vote it independently on their assistive device, but then ultimately they need assistance getting that ballot back because they have to print it out. So I'm just curious where, where you stand on that. Uh, hey, Bob, good to see you. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question, actually, because we were really excited to see you out front and leading on this issue in New Jersey, and I'm sorry that you all received some pushback on that. We do believe that full electronic delivery marking and return is the most accessible way to, to provide it. At this point, um, to, <laughs> the more you take the paper out of the process, the more accessible it becomes for a larger number of people just in general, right? Anyone who can't physically handle that piece of paper, a fully electronic vote is gonna be more accessible to them. Anyone who is blind or low vision or has any other sort of print disability, once they print that page, they're not gonna be able to verify it visually and they are probably still going to need some form of assistance returning it. I also worry about this a lot in the era of COVID-19. I don't know about you all, but I don't own a printer and I've been home since March. So I can't even print that page, to be perfectly honest with you. So anything that takes the paper out of the process is definitely going to increase the accessibility and probably your ability to stay home uh, and vote completely by mail if that's what you need to do for your own safety. So we look for that. Uh, I know that there are different vendors out there that offer different products and they have different, they all typically have you know, an electronic delivery process and then some different offerings in terms of return. Um, and I know that there are some like fully online web portals for return, but there are also some other options where, you know, it maybe gets downloaded as a PDF and then you're returning that in an email, um, which at least removes that, that element of the paper handling and having to verify some print from the process. So I think it's worth really looking at your options. I think electronic delivery only is the most common right now because it is the least controversial. 
but it also is realistically the least accessible. It's, um, it's better than nothing at all, but it is, should not be confused with being compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. To be honest, if you don't have a system that has full electronic delivery mark in return, your vote by mail systems are still out of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I would not hesitate to say that the majority of mail voting systems in the country are, are still not compliant with the ADA. Uh, and that's something that I would be thinking about right now because we know any major election year is a tangle of litigation. Any major election year, you all have been through it, you've seen it firsthand. This year is going to be exceptionally so. We've already seen so much litigation. I imagine we're gonna see more. I promise you for as many litigators as you see out there looking at other issues, there are litigators that are looking at accessibility issues and they're really focused on vote by mail right now. So it's something that I think has flown under the radar for a really long time. And for that reason, I think we have not really succeeded at pushing models that are going to be more accessible for a greater number of voters. And I think the, the further we embrace it, the more I think we can develop systems that truly work for everyone. Uh, one of the things that also holds me back a little bit from these systems, I stress that you need them. If all you've got is mailing someone a piece of paper, you should put something in place ASAP. That's pretty far out of compliance. There could, there could be some consequences to that, right? Uh, for anyone who doesn't have some sort of system right now. But the more we embrace them, you know, the systems we have right now also rely on the voter having a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, some sort of uh, internet or cellular data service in their homes. And not everyone has that. That's still not something that we can guarantee. The more we embrace these kinds of systems, the more we can also offer uh, points at which you can cast that ballot um, from, from other locations, uh, which, you know, is not necessarily gonna happen in a COVID-19 environment, but we really haven't spent the last 20 years fortifying our remote voting systems to be able to support that anyway. That's something I'd really love to see going forward. I think in the broader context, we really support research and development funding to, to see that happen. But in terms of right now, 2020, I, I think there needs to be at least some system in place. And to be honest, the more options you have for return, I think the more accessible it's gonna be for more voters. I got a question in the chat for Karen uh, from Florida. Um, if curbside voting is spelled out specifically in the law or if it was uh, implemented within your existing legal framework for accommodating voters and how you handle it if there's more than one voter in the vehicle. Um, it is a, a specific law that we have. Um, I can provide that to um, Amy to share. Uh, and then we were, uh, our law, the way a lot of our, our laws are written, instruct us to write the rules around those. So we wrote rules pertaining to how curbside would be administered. Um, and then in terms of how it's handled with multiple voters in the car, um, that's not that uncommon. And um, you know, I think the efficient way to do it is to have multiple clipboards and to administer those oaths and, and you know, just make one walk. Um, and that's certainly permissible. Um, it doesn't have to be handled um, individually. Thanks. We have uh, another question for you from New Mexico. Um, do you have additional election workers that you hire specifically for curbside? Um, and uh, how do you handle that? So for all of our polling places, the law requires us to have at least three election officials. Um, but generally, you'll find that we have five to nine uh, election officials working, uh, particularly in a presidential election, you'll see the larger numbers. Um, so with that, uh, among, among, among that team uh, would be someone designated to do curbside. Now, what we typically encourage is for everyone to be trained on all the duties within a polling place. Um, so that you can rotate and you wouldn't have one person doing all of that walking the whole time, or if they were the check-in official, they wouldn't be seated the entire time working at a computer or the label station. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we, we handle it. Um, so I can say anecdotally, um, when I was a county election director, there was one particular lady uh, who loved to do curbside voting. 
Um, and so she always was willing uh, to do that uh, for one of our one-stop one early voting sites. And everybody was happy to let her do it because she would do it rain or shine or snow. <laughs> Does having one person whose primary responsibility is curbside, does that uh, cause any delays in your voting locations? Because now there's, say, only two people instead of three. Uh, you know, I think what you have to account for is the, the size of the, the precinct, you know, how many voter, registered voters there are, um, and, and just assign as many officials as you can. Um, that's one of the things that our counties are working on now is, is to assign more than one probably um, because of, of COVID-19. Um, so, and, and I would say that, you know, when I mentioned that during our, our early voting period, we would often have care facilities to bring folks. We, we like to schedule appointments for that uh, so that we could send in a county board of election officials um, to assist as well uh, to help with some of that support. Other questions or uh, concerns or anything like that for the, the panel? Either uh, raise your hand or uh, type it in the chat. To our panel, do you want to make any sort of closing remarks, wrap-up remarks? We have a minute or two. Yeah, I could. This is Michelle. I'd say I'm trying to think of what's the most important thing, the one thing I'd want you to take away today. And, and I don't know if there's any one best practice. Like I said, I think we have to have a, a really broad range of options for voters in general, but especially during these times. So I think if there was one thing I'd really love for you all to take away from today, it would be to talk to people with disabilities and making these decisions and really integrate disability organizations and voters with disabilities into your complete process, into your planning process, right? Rather than trying to make these decisions on your own uh, and hoping that it's the right thing and um, potentially finding out kind of late in the game that there might have been a better way to go. Uh, so we really are anxious to be a part of that process with you. You can absolutely reach out to me and our network if you don't already have um, some connections that you can go to and bring into this process. But really, we find that the most accessible systems are the ones in which people with disabilities are a part of the total process, that decision-making process all the way through, rather than accessibility as sort of an afterthought to a process that we've already planned. Um, I can't stress that enough, and we really want to be a part of this and, and partner with you to, to make the decisions during what is a really difficult election. And Amy, I'll just point out, you know, as I said, this is something, curbside voting is something that North Carolina has done um, for, for many years now. It's not in response to COVID-19, like I know many are, are, try, are having to consider, but, you know, I would encourage people to look at making this a permanent part of their election processes because it really does serve a population that, you know, in any given time could have difficulty coming into the polling place. And by being, you know, that person who can come and go uh, from the facility uh, to do that for them really is a, a, a service that we owe to our voters. And, um, and it may be that it's a, a, a permanent disability that keeps them from coming in, or it may be a situation where, you know, they've pulled their Achilles heel and can't stand and walk into the polling place that easily. Um, so, you know, it, those are the things to think about and how, um, you know, it, it's a pretty simple process that provides a tremendous service. Lori, do you want to close this out? Yes. So, um, am I closing us out of the whole day or just the session? <laughs> Get my march in order Both. from my box. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to say uh, thank you to, um, to Michelle and to Karen for joining us today. This is a conversation um, that always has to happen, but I think um, not only always has to happen, it's particularly important right now because I think that the impacts to voters living with disabilities 
um, is is just different, and it's great, and um, it has to be it has to be front and center and part of the conversation. And so, working collaboratively um, with organizations that represent these voters and with our voters directly, it's just. Um, just vital. So, Michelle, we always appreciate you um, joining us. Um, you're like a part of the NASA team. So, thank you for being here today, and um, thank you, Karen, for sharing that too. Um, I, I don't know if Amy has. Do you have any other closing remarks before I totally close this out? Okay. Um, well, I will say um, this has been an amazing couple of days. Um, I know that it's not the same. Uh, as when we have opportunities to meet in person and collaborate. But if all I get is your squares on a screen, um, I'll take it. Um, and I think everybody's feeling that way. Um, I, I miss seeing you and, and um, you know, being able to network and collaborate. Um, but I do think that Amy did a great job pulling us together. And she's probably going to get embarrassed because I keep giving her kudos. But uh, really, I can't say enough how thankful we are for you to give us this opportunity to learn from each other um, because it is really vital and uh, super important for us to have an opportunity to connect. So thank you, Amy. Um, and um, this is it for the public portion. So I want to say thank you to those people. Um, thank you to our states and territories that joined, but also thanks to those of you that are um, watching us from uh, YouTube. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your continued support of NASED and elections nationwide. So um, thank you for participating, and uh, we hope to see you in person next year. Uh, and we'll be in touch with more details about that. So thanks, everybody, and hope you have a great weekend.